Um, okay, Fred, I wanted to do a fast response to you. I don't know if... You, uh, there's someone in the other room playing music, so I hope I don't get slapped with a um, copyright violation just because someone's playing music in the other room. But um, anyway, I watched your video directed to me, and I'm going to do something that seems probably a little bit eccentric. As you can see on the screen, I've put up a novel. It's a classic science fiction novel that I read when I was about 12 years old. And it's by a writer that almost nobody reads ever. Um, for some reason, somebody probably died, and his uh, whole collection of Stapleton literature was donated to my library when I was about 12. <clears throat> so they were what I had in the library. And um, I went to a pretty strict school. We were only allowed to bring three books of our own. So um, I read everything in our library, and I really liked um, Stapleton's. You know, you evoked the movie Sophie's Choice. Um, what I liked about Stapleton was that he was actually a philosophy professor in Liverpool in the 30s, I think. Um, the books in our library were old and tattered and broken spines. <laughs> Pages came out when you read them. Um, but his idea of the world was something I had never encountered before. And it was the first time I'd ever, for example, read the idea that human beings could be some sort of infestation on planet Earth. They could be vermin. Um, and I found that really fascinating and realistic, and it somehow seemed like it might be the state of affairs, all right. And so I read Last and First Men. I read all of his stuff, which almost nobody ever does. And I came to some conclusions about some of his writing. It's He's got this idea that we are going to be involved in, at some evolutionary point, in a sort of Manichaean struggle of good against evil. And I see that a whole lot on YouTube, that it's always, there are two sides to everything. There's the side of right justice um, and the side of terrible injustice and ignorance, the rest of it. So it's something that when I see it on YouTube, because I've thought about it for quite a while, um, I want to see the complexity beneath the superficial dichotomy of good against evil, because it's almost never that simple, and I certainly don't think it's that simple in this case. You paint the environmental dilemma and the nightmare of the environmental dilemma, and it's something that I think about a lot, too. I don't come to the conclusions you do, and I don't come to those conclusions not because I think the world is all roses and sunshine and the rest of it, but because I think that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if, if selection evolutionary selection is for um, the fittest, th for an environment. You have to see how to make the environment more conducive to cooperative behavior, and you have to see that you can't fix everything. You, you also really can't fix the environment, and you're not going to have much effect on evolutionary progression. It's a very slow, accretive process. It's taken millions of years. What you can do is do what is within your power to do. But I think maybe what makes more sense, rather than my just going on and on and on about my particular opinion on this, I'm just going to read three brief paragraphs from the epilogue of Star Maker. The whole planet, the whole rock grain with its busy swarms, as I said, he loved to refer to human beings as vermin and swarms. I now saw as an arena where two antagonists, two spirits, were already preparing for a critical stru struggle, already assuming terrestrial and local guise and coming to grips in our half-awakened mind, in city upon city, in village after village, and in innumerable lonely farmsteads, cottages, hovels, shacks, huts, and all the crevices where human creatures were intent on their little comforts and triumphs and escapes, the great struggle of our age was brewing. One antagonist appeared as the will to dare for the sake of the new, the longed for, the reasonable, the joyful world, in which every man and woman may have scope to live fully and live in service of humanity. The other seemed essentially the myopic fear of the unknown, or was it more sinister? Was it the cunning will for private mastery, which fomented for its own ends the anarchic, reason-hating, and vindictive passion of the tribe. <clears throat> it seemed that in the coming storm, all the dearest things must be destroyed, all private happiness, all loving, all creative work in art, science, and philosophy, 
all intellectual scrutiny, all speculative imagination, and all creative social building, all, indeed, that man should normally live for, seemed folly and mockery and mere self-indulgence in the presence of the public calamity. But if we fail to preserve them, when would they live again? How to face such an age, how to muster courage, being capable only of homely virtue? To do this, yet preserve the mind's integrity, never to let the struggle destroy in one's own heart what one had tried to serve in the world, the spirit of integrity. Um, that seems to me the best we can do, really. Um, we can't do more. I mean, there are some areas in which I would disagree. For example, he says, he actually said mankind, but I changed it to humankind, because I always hate the word mankind. But um, y you might not want that word because it is speciesism, and I realize that. I mean, I too am a vegetarian, you know. I too care about suffering in the world, and I care about animals when they suffer. But I think the thing that gets to me about this whole dilemma and this whole debate is there are certain taboo things you can't say, and one of them is that we are in the situation we are in, and we find the world as we find it. It's not the world that I would want it to be, or obviously you would want it to be, but we can't do any more than do what we can within the world we find. And um, the more we anguish over how unfair the world as we find it really is, um, the more it just seems like wasted effort to me. And the more it seems to be, at least to me, a turning away from um, the complexity of the fact that evolution in a lot of ways is not a pretty process and there is suffering. It is the way life evolves. And I do not think that the choice then is to say that we can eliminate all life. And there are lots of reasons for that. I know you're not advocating that, but it gets advocated a lot and it doesn't even seem like a viable option to me. Um, it seems like we've got to make the world more humane um, in the best sense of that, not, not as just human beings, inter self-interested human beings only interested in our own welfare, but we have to look at all of the matrix that we are in and see what can be done and what can't be done. And uh, even if we vehemently and with great enthusiasm wanted to eliminate all life, um, there's no way that that would happen. So we might as well really live in the world as we find it and do the best that we can as individuals and in cooperative groups while realizing that our circle of care cannot extend to everything that suffers. I wish it could. And it's agonizing that it can't, but it can't. Um, so we just have to be, it seems to me, willing to live in the world as it is and not as the world is. We want it to be because we feel shortchanged by the injustice. That's my take on this.